So this session takes off very much from where Shashi left off before lunch. Um, the Koh-i-Noor being the most famous piece of imperial loot. Uh, loot, as, as Shashi indicated before lunch, is from the uh, originally an Urdu word, unknown in English until the 1760s, when it mysteriously enters the English lexicon uh, and spreads with great rapidity through the British Isles. And of all the various things plundered by my compatriots from, uh, uh, from India, none has caused more upset uh, or, been, or has uh, a greater uh, uh, resonance in South and Western Asia than the koh i -Noor, the Mountain of Light, which is uh, not the world's largest diamond, but is certainly the world's most infamous diamond and the one with the greatest uh, baggage attached to it. Uh, there are currently no less than six countries that claim this diamond. Uh, one of them, uh, uh, my own, has it locked up behind iron gates in the Tower of London. Uh, but five others currently have lawsuits active um, to get it back. Most obviously, and with, the, with um, probably the, uh, the, the most obvious claim to it, India. But also Pakistan, Bangladesh, Iran... Afghanistan and a late and, and perhaps slightly unlikely contender, but one held with great passion, the Taliban. Uh, Mullah, <laughs> Mullah Omar uh, put in a belated claim for the koh i uh, It's not clear from which cave or post office in, in Kandahar the letter was written to the Queen asking to give this thing back, but uh, uh, it certainly arrived, uh, and uh, uh, should we say it's still pending, this claim? <laughs> um, What's interesting about the Koh-i-Noor is that, like many mythologized objects, its history has sort of accumulated um, through a process of, 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 of rumor and legend and whisperings. And when Anita and I began to tackle this two or three years ago, uh, we found that it was incredibly difficult to establish the early history of this diamond. If you go onto Wikipedia to, uh, or look at any of the earlier articles or books that, and there are, is a huge literature attached to this stone. Um, in fact, we should have the stone up uh, if I can work out how to use this thing. Where are we? Here, we are. Here is the stone today in its current form. If you go on Wikipedia, you will see a version of its history which can be traced back to a document written by a British official uh, in 1849. That official was a young man named Theo Metcalf, and this document was written, was commissioned by Lord Dalhousie in the immediate week that he got his hands on this diamond. He wrote to this young official who was known to be interested in gems, who was based in Delhi, and he asked him to uh, research the gems history, partly by talking to the the great jewelers of Chandni Chowk, Chandni Chowk in Delhi being the greatest uh, jewel mart in Asia, but also by going into the Red Fort, where the Mughal family, the imperial family, was still living, and talked to the old princes and princesses. And through a process of the, gathering these interviews, Theo Metcalf wrote a history which has basically remained the history of the diamond that you'll see this if you go onto your cell phone at this moment, Google koh or up comes Wikipedia, there's the history. The st history goes something like this. The Koh-i-Noor diamond was mined in deepest antiquity in the legendary Golconda diamond mines, found deep within the earth, brought up, placed eventually in the eye of an idol in the temple of the Kakatiya dynasty, the great Hindu dynasty that ruled uh, what became the Golconda area uh, in, the, in the early centuries AD. In the 12th and centuries onwards, the Kalji's, uh, uh, Islamicized Turks from Central Asia, uh, based in Delhi, plundered the temples of the south and brought back among their treasures the Koh-i-Noor, which they smashed the idol and took the diamond to Delhi, only to lose it, first to the Tukluks, then to the Lodis, and then to the Mughals. It stayed in the Mughal dynasty until the playful Muhammad Shah Rangila hid it in his turban when his, uh, when his uh, kingdom was invaded by the Persians. Unfortunately for him, the Persian king, Nadir Shah, was sleeping with the same courtesan that he was sleeping with. 
And as part of their pillow talk, uh, Noor Bai, this notorious woman, revealed the hiding place of the Koh i Noor. So as he was leaving Delhi, he said as a last gesture, we are such friends, Muhammad Shah. Just let us swap turbans as a memory of brotherhood from each other. <laughs> and so it was, according to this uh, uh, version of history, that the Koh i Noor went to Persia. Now, unfortunately, every single item of that history I've just given you is, to use a technical term, bullshit. <laughs> They're very nice stories, but they are no more than that. Uh, and I in a process of extensive research, we've actually been able to trace the diamond no further back than the peacock throne of Shah Jahan built in the 1640s. And the first actual firm, hard historical reference we have to the koh i -Noor is to it as part of Shah Jahan's greatest piece of uh, of, uh, of, of creation, his greatest uh, thing, other than perhaps the Taj Mahal, except that the t peacock throne cost four times as much as the Taj to build. Anyway, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, so let me just go back uh, a little bit. So, here's what we can say about the Koh i Noor and diamonds in India with a fair amount of certainty. Until the discovery of the New World Mines in Brazil in the 1730s, all the world's diamonds, with the exception of a few black diamonds from the mountains of Sarawak, all the world's diamonds came from India. They were India's greatest export in ancient times. They, it's quite probable some scholars believe that the pyramids were cut using Indian diamond-tipped uh, uh, cutting tools. Uh, they were... Uh, found in very early in China. They made their way to Rome. Trashy mentioned Pliny complaining about uh, uh, all the Roman ladies uh, using Indian luxury items. Uh, among the things he complains about is the fact that, that, that people are wearing diamond rings, which he says are useless. Uh, but these all came from India. And in India, not only were diamonds considered to be objects of great value, as they were all over the world, they were also considered to be sacred objects. And you get in the early Puranas, and this is a, uh, an image from the uh, Bhagavad Purana, and you can see um, uh, th well, well, the king of Dwarka uh, holding this bright gem, the Siamantika gem, which he's about to give to Lord Krishna. And uh, the Siamantika gem, usually said to be a diamond, sometimes said to be a ruby, was the gem of the sun god Surya, who came down to earth in the response to um, uh, tapasya, to, to uh, penance done by devotees. He gave it, and wherever it went, when it wasn't with Krishna, the perfect man, when it was given to any mortal, it left a trail of havoc behind it, because only a perfect man could hold a diamond like this. So when um, the king of Dwarka gives it to his brother, it goes out into the forest, uh, and uh, the, uh, the man is killed first by a lion, then the it's seized by a bear. Krishna has to go and rescue it. He gives it to his father-in-law. But his father-in-law is decapitated. You can see a gory picture of a headless corpse in the middle there with the women upstairs shrieking with, in the upper register, pulling out their hair. And this, uh, this demonic-looking figure to the left with a large sword has just cut off Krishna's father-in-law's head. Um, and that's the Simantika gem. And it's from this very early text that we have the idea that spreads into Western literature of the cursed gem of a diamond which brings with it bad luck. And there is an, a complex and sophisticated astrology associated with all gemstones in, in India, but particularly with diamonds. And it has to be, for good, diamond to bring good luck, it has to be completely flawless. Any diamond that has even a trace of a crow's foot or a scratch or clouds inside its wards uh, can bring bad luck. Uh, and um, this idea, of course, travels eventually to England with the time of uh, Wilkie Collins and the Moonstone and enters Sherlock Holmes. And there's a whole long sort of uh, genre of cursed stones that but it emerges from this, this base, from the, uh, from the Puranas. So in ancient India, with this rich gemology, in many courts, gems rather than clothing is the normal um, way that people would be uh, delineated in court. Their rank would be known by what they wore. So... This is an Apsara from Kajarao, now in the Met. But you can see she's wearing very little except gems. And uh, versions of this was true in many of the ancient courts in India. Now, when the Mughals come, 
This is Babo and Humayun uh, in a wonderful manuscript again in the Met. Um, you get a different gemology entering India. There's a, a, a very large and coherent body of, of Hindu astrology associated with diamonds and, and semi-scientific works, long and detailed studies of gemology. But a totally different tradition arrives first with the Sultanates, then with the Mughals. And for the Mughals, it's not diamonds, but rubies and red stones of light, which are the most important gems. And very interesting, in Abul Faisal's description of the Mughal treasury, the top tier uh, is spinels, which today we don't value particularly highly, and rubies from Burma. And the second layer has d uh, of the treasury, the second, only the second division, is diamonds, sapphires, and emeralds and pearls. Um, so the, the Mughals have their own ideas, and they, their appreciation of redstones comes from their appreciation of poetry. Hafiz and the great uh, Persian poets talk about, a lot about redstones of light and comparing it to the glow of the evening sun. And the Mughals develop a, a considerable connoisseurship. This is the young um, Prince Salim, the would-be future uh, Jahangir. And many of these Mughal uh, emperors are depicted holding sarpeshes or, or turban ornaments. And their connoisseurship of gems is one of the things that distinguishes. This is the young Shah Jahan, again holding an aigrette, a turban ornament. And the Mughals are very clever, particularly Shah Jahan, in using gems as part of their imperial propaganda. Just as Shah Jahan learns to use architecture as a way of, of bigging up his, di his, di his dynasty, so he uses gems. It's not just something that he admires privately in his bedroom at home. It's something that he uses as a way of augmenting uh, himself as the representative of God on earth. And um, there are wonderful descriptions by the friar Manrique of uh, a, a mogul feast, which uh, Manrique, is, the friar, is watching from a balcony. And he says the most beautiful dancing girls in the world were brought in after dinner. These beautiful creatures dancing like angels. But Shah Jahan didn't look up once because he'd just been given a tray of rubies and diamonds by his brother-in-law. And he spent the whole time examining them. Literally didn't raise his eyes once. And eventually, he has inherited all the gems collected by the various sultanates, which are when, when his great-grandfather Babo conquered. On top of that, his father has introduced an annual Nowruz ceremony when every noble in court has to give him enormous quantities of gems if he wants promotion. On top of which, under Jahangir and early Shah Jahan, the Mughals actually conquer the Golconda mines and the great mines of the Deccan. So by his adulthood, Shah Jahan controls the greatest collection of gems in history. And he uses it to build this. This is the peacock throne. It's more like a sort of kiosk than the, than the Western idea of a throne. You could sell ice creams from this if you were <laughs> very grand. Uh, but it's, uh, it, they basically put into this the cream of their gem collection. And, and it, it, it costs four times the cost of the Taj to build because it's got every great gem in Indian history attached in this one incredibly brilliant object. And you can imagine it in the center of the Red Fort, this incredibly beautiful object glittering in the sun with the, the emperor. And it has an astrological reference. It's the peacock throne because it's based on the Quranic description of the throne of Solomon. And the peacocks on the roof, the, uh, the cedar-like pillars, these are all uh, meant to, m to mirror the fact that the moguls are positioning themselves as the symbols of justice, the new Solomons. These, the Solomon in the Quran represents justice and wisdom. Uh, and so the Mughals are saying, we are his successors. We are the legitimate kings of this area. We're not just Turkic warlords who happen to invade this country, which of course is the truth. Uh, they're saying we are the Solomonic successors. We represent divine kingship. We are the children of the sun. Uh, out of this glittering canopy, um, we, so bright you can barely look at it, uh, we represent God on earth. Uh, and so successful are the Mughals in projecting this that, um, that uh, the, uh, uh, the word mogul enters the English language at this time. You have the first English traders arriving, stumbling around in sort of Bruegelian cod pieces, um, and sort of, sort of clumpy old Tudors, when these gorgeously refined uh, Persianate princes wafting around in silks. And mogul enters the English language 
as a synonym for power and wealth. So that when, ironically, a clown like Trump describes himself as a media, as a, as a property mogul, uh, unwittingly he's describing himself as an Islamic monarch, which is not perhaps something that he uh, recognizes. <laughs> um, anyway, it stays with the moguls, and because we know from this, uh, the first historic reference to the Kohinoor, which occurs in a Persian source by a chronicler called, uh, called Yazidi, he says that the Kohinoor is the glittering head of the peacock at the top of the peacock throne. And that is the number one, in a sense, discovery of this, uh, first sort of uh, textual discovery in this book, in that this is the first historic reference that is absolutely verifiable and clearly the stone that is in the, in the Tower of London today. It may be various other huge diamonds which are described in the Babonama and various other things, but we just don't know because there were several very large diamonds. No one today remembers the Darianor, which is known as the sister of the, of, of the Kohinoor. That's in Tehran today. Who, out of a show, I mean, a show of hands, who, who had heard of the Kohinoor here before today? Who'd heard of the Darianor? Who'd heard of the Orlov diamond? Okay, the Orlov is the biggest of all. One man in the audience. The Orlov is the great Mughal diamond, uh, the largest of all the Mughal stones. The reason that you've all heard uh, th of the Kohinoor, none of you have heard of the, or uh, one of you has heard of the Orlov, and ten of you have heard of the Darianor, is something that Anita will reveal later, the, the various bits of propaganda that took place later in its history. Uh, but uh, the Mughals as a whole did not big up their diamonds. The only stone that we have in Mughal sources referred to is the Timur ruby, which was attached to the other peacock. And this we know about from Mughal sources, but it's only when the Persians see this that they record the presence of the Kohinoor, because for the Mughals, diamonds weren't that exciting. Rubies and spinels were the big deal. <coughs> so, so it's a much more complicated tale than we would imagine. In reality, the Kohinoor only comes into prominence quite late in its history. Anyway, it remains with the Mughals in the peacock throne through the reign of Aurangzeb until we get to Muhammad Shah Rangila, the pleasure-loving, cross-dressing, uh, artistic. He's like the Charles II of, uh, uh, of uh, India. After Aurangzeb, who's the, who, who's the kind of Oliver Cromwell, who bans music, hates painting, is a real old bore, um, Muhammad Shah Rangila makes up for 50 years of Puritanism in one reign with sort of mass orgies and cross-dressing, eunuchs, you know, all the usual. Uh, and <laughs> here he is at it. Anyway, we'll get... We'll get <laughs> Anyway, uh, it's during his reign that the, 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 this amazing warlord, uh, Nadir Shah, appears. Nadir Shah, as you can see from this rather grim portrait, is the opposite of Muhammad Shah Rangila. He is a peasant born the son of a shepherd on the step between Meshed and Herat. He comes, sweeps down to India with the Persian army when Muhammad Shah Rangila is busy sort of playing sort of, sort of strange, uh, we won't go into the games, but uh, in the Red Fort. Uh, and uh, the Mughal Empire pulls itself together for one last time, and three massive Mughal armies mass on the plain of Karnal. One from Delhi, led by Muhammad Shah in person, one from uh, Hyderabad, led by uh, Nizam al-Mulk, the first Nizam of Hyderabad, and one uh, from Avad, led by uh, Sadat Ali Khan, the first Nawab of Avad. Each amass to about a third of a million. So together you have about, I think, um, there are 1.5 million men on the plain of Karnal, on the Indian side, of whom at least half are fighting men. So around an army of, let's say, 750,000 cavalry. And the Nadir Shah lures them out of their encampment. He only has 100,000. He lures them out, and you get this last great Mughal heavy cavalry. They mass up five miles along the plain. They level their lances, they've got heavy armor, they're all glittering in the sun, and they go forward, first trotting, then cantering, and then into a full gallop. This force that no one in South Asia has ever been able to withstand, the full Mughal cavalry charge. But at the last minute, the Persian light cavalry part like a curtain, and they reveal in front of them Nadir Shah's invention, which is called the swivel gun. And it's very simply, uh, the kind of precursor of the tank, really. It's a, it's a heavy jezail with a long barrel that fires an enormous fat slug that can penetrate armor. 
and, it, and by means of a tripod, it can be balanced on the neck of a horse. And Nadia Shah has invented this thing. He's used it to defeat the Ottomans. Now he brings it to India. And as the Mughals charge, the Persians just line up to receive them, and there's a single volley. And the cream of Mughal uh, chivalry lie dead on the ground. It's like one of the great moments of sort of world military history. And the following day, Nadia Shah on the right invites Muhammad Shah on the left to dinner, and the idiot goes. Uh, he goes with seven bodyguards who are, of course, disarmed the minute they enter the Persian camp. And Nadia uh, Shah says, my brother, let us go together to Delhi. And he marches into Delhi, and in the next three months, he just dismantles the peacock throne and carts away 9,000 wagons of loot. It's the greatest act of looting in history, arguably. Everything the Mughals themselves had looted from the rest of India and gathered into the Red Fort in Delhi and Agra is taken away. Now, the British like to feel they were quite good at looting, but we were rank amateurs, uh, whatever Shashi says, compared to uh, Nadir Shah. Uh, and this was the most extraordinary moment in Mughal history when the entire Mughal wealth is carted off by Nadir Shah, including the peacock throne. And it's at this point that we get the first description of the Kohinoor. Now, it doesn't end happily for anyone that owns the Kohinoor. Um, Nadir Shah is assassinated by his own bodyguard shortly afterwards. In the middle of the night, there is this terrific scene of looting as the peacock throne is, is smashed to bits by the, all, all the Persian nobility with battle axes, diamonds and spinels and rubies flying around in, in the tent in the darkness. But one man escapes with the Kohinoor, and that is the chief of Nadir Shah's bodyguard, ah Ahmed Shah Abdali. And he, is, he protects Nadir Shah's harem during the night, according to his own account. And in the morning is given this by Chuki, the, the chief queen of Nadir Shah, along with the Daryanur. And they, he rides off to Kandahar, and he uses it to found a new country, Afghanistan. And Afghanistan is born with the Kohinoor as its founding piece of capital. He uses this as a way to raise money and uh, to gather the troops that will create the Durrani Empire. And anyone that knows their Indian history knows that the, the, uh, the Duranis come down and they defeat the Marathas on the plains of Panipat in, uh, in 1761. Uh, but even as, Nadir, as sorry, Ahmed Shah Abdali is creating this great empire, his face is being eaten away by a tumor. And like Robocop, he covers it with a golden mask dotted with diamonds. But this doesn't stop his face separating. And towards the end of his life, as he's defeating the Marathas, as he's this extraordinarily successful military leader, maggots are dropping from his rotting nose onto his food as he eats. It's worse to come. It's worse to come. Anyway. <laughs> Anita, Anita, am I at the end of my time? Yeah. I'm, I'm done. So <laughs> Race forward. It passes from Amir Shah Abdali to his son, Timur Shah, who's a kind of dwarf. Uh, he passes it to his son, uh, Shah Shudra Muk, who does look like a dwarf from Lord of the Rings. He looks like Gimli, uh, but actually is a bit taller. Um, and he uh, is thrown off his uh, kingdom in Afghanistan, flees uh, uh, away, and is captured by one of his own nobles. But his wife takes refuge with this man, Ranjit Singh, Shari Punjab, the Lion of the Punjab. Uh, the first great Sikh leader who's created a new Sikh kingdom out of Lahore. And she does a deal with Ranjit Singh and basically says, if you spring my husband from prison, the Kohinoor is yours. Husband is sprung from prison and understandably then says, I never said he could have the Kohinoor. <laughs> I don't care what she said. So Ranjit Singh tortures their son in front of him until he hands it over. So Ranjit Singh gets it through, according to the Afghan accounts, extremely nefarious uh, means. Uh, but Nadish, I mean, uh, sorry, Ranjit Singh wears it on his white pajamas alone. And this is for the first time that the Kohinoor is worn on its own. Previously, uh, uh, Ahmed Shah Abdali had worn it on an armlet with the Timur ruby on one arm and the Kohinoor on another. So had, uh, so had Timur Shah, so had Shah Shuja. But Ranjit Singh, for the first time, elevates the Kohinoor into a symbol of kingship. And then this is the first time that travelers begin to describe the Kohinoor as this symbol of sovereignty, as this symbol of kingship. And when Ranjit Singh is dying in his 
uh, in his palace in Lahore. He wants it to go. He associates it. So bloody is the history. I've only given you a, a, a little soupçon of the horrors. Uh, Anita will give you, let you sup with many more. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so, uh, so horrific is the history of this stone already that he associates it with the Siamantica gem of myth of the Puranas, which has left this uh, sea of devastation behind it. And he wants to give it back to Krishna's own temple at Jagannath, at Puri. Uh, but as he lies, uh, having had a stroke on his deathbed, the Koinor has disappeared. And at this point, I'll hand over to Anita. Um, thank you very much indeed, William. Uh, William. William is one of those people that you really don't want to follow in a talk. Because he's that good. He's irritating, actually. And what he's done is he has, in the completely brilliant genius Dalrymple way, he has galloped you through hundreds of years of history. I'm going to focus on the period of history um, where the gem was lost from India and makes its way to the tower, where it is today, swathed in all of the controversy uh, that exists and that we talk about in the book. So, as William said, um, Ranjit Singh, Sher e Punjab, the Lion of Punjab, has turned this diamond now into a symbol of might, of empire, of strength. And it is something that everybody wants which possibly goes to explain what follows his death. So Ranjit Singh has died. The diamond has disappeared because one man has decided that his master, no matter how great he might have been and no matter how much he loved him, should not decide the fate of the Kohenor. That man is Misir Beliram. He's the treasurer. He is loyal to the king, one of the most loyal people in the kingdom. His brother serves in the army. His sons work for Ranjit Singh. His father also worked in the treasury. He is loyal to the bone marrow. But he says, no, the Kohenor is bigger than even my Maharaja. It belongs to this empire. It will pass to the man who sits on the throne next. And herein lies the problem. Now, um, William has told you about maggots and suppurating sores. He also has a fantastic story in questions. Remind him to ask you about the Game of Thrones thing uh, that is <laughs> a real thing, uh, which the Kohenor has spawned. But I, I like to bring you this, the roulette wheel of death. So after Ranjit Singh died, you can see in the top uh, left-hand corner of your screen, his heir, uh, Kurek Singh, the crown prince. Now, Kurek Singh is the man who is going to wear the diamond next. And this is the man that Belly Ram has defied his master's wishes for. He's, he's saved the diamond from the gods to give it to this guy. The problem is, this man is not worthy. So there's a wonderful travel writer. I don't know if any of you have come across her. She's brilliant. She's an adventuress who is, is in India at this time, a woman called Emily Eden, who writes fantastic accounts of her travels through Asia. She sketches, uh, she takes notes, she sups with these people, and she describes Kurek Singh as an opium-eating blockhead. <laughs> and she is not wrong. Because Kurek Singh is absolutely the guy you want to go out with on a Saturday night. He is not the guy you want governing your kingdom. He likes drugs, he likes booze, he likes girls. He's a proper laddo, as we say, in our country. And it isn't long before the people of the realm, the, the good aristocrats of the Darbar, decide he's got to go. And so they start to poison him slowly, with a mixture of uh, ras comfort and white lead, safed akhursi, and they mix it in his food. And imperceptibly, this king is being murdered before our very eyes. Nobody notices. You know, he starts to slur. Well, nobody notices. He's always drunk. He always slurs. He starts tripping over things a bit more. His coordination, it starts attacking his, his nervous system. Well, he's always drunk. He's falling over. Nobody notices. They only notice when it's too late. When blood starts leaking into his inner cavities, it feels like his skin is on fire and he has to take to his bed. And they call back to the kingdom his 19-year-old son, the young man at the top in the yellow box, Nornihal Singh who is everything his father is not. He's noble, he's clean living, he fights as a soldier, he has the trust of his men. So when Kurek Singh dies and they unstrap that diamond from his arm, Lahore breathes a sigh of relief. We can put the Kohenor and we can give the kingship to a man who is worthy, Nornihal Singh. 
everything will be fine. Nonihal does not even make it past his father's funeral. The ashes are still hot when he goes to the river to wash the ceremony. It's a ceremonial part to wash the ashes from his body and purify himself. And he's walking back to the palace. And if any of you have been to Lahore, lucky enough to have gone to Lahore, uh, outside uh, the palace there is a, a beautiful garden. And it is called the Hazuri Bagh. It happens to be a garden that Ranjit Singh, the, the gentleman I showed you uh, before, um, he built it in commemoration of his seizure of the Kohenor diamond. So there is young Nonhal coming back, and he passes through the Hazuri Gate. And mysteriously and unaccountably, a block of masonry falls from the top of the gate, crushing his companion to death on the spot. It also catches Nornihal a glancing blow. And if you look at contemporary reports, there is a man called Alexander Gardner who is serving uh, in the court of Ranjit Singh. Ranjit Singh was very famous for hiring Western mercenaries in his army. Alexander Gardner is standing a few steps behind this, this ill-fated party and he writes that Nornihal gets up, dusts himself off, he's in a bad mood, it's on Alexander Gardner's insistence that he's stretched to the palace, even though he doesn't want to be. He's talking, he's asking for water. However, when the royal physician turns up a little while later to attend to his grumpy prince, what he finds is not a man who could have walked away or asked for water or done anything at all because his head is entirely caved in and there is grey matter all over the sheets. The accident, the block of masonry. Nonihal dies in the night, and they keep the news secret for three days, because to lose one king in a week, bad luck. To lose two, well, I mean, it's kind of Oscar Wilde handbag territory. So what happens when Nonihal dies is that his mother swings into action, because Ranjit Singh had many wives, and the wives had many sons. And so this woman here in the bottom of your screen, Maharani Chandkor, the mother of Nornihal, the widow of Karak Singh. She's lost so much already, but she knows she has to do something quickly to keep the throne in her family line. So she orders the gates of the citadel closed, and she tells the aristocrats, just wait, just wait, because my daughter-in-law is pregnant, and please God, praise God, she will have a son. So everybody waits. The tension, imagine, on this pregnant young woman. And she does indeed give birth to a son, but the son is stillborn. So talk in Lahore of this diamond starts spreading around, the Siamantica gem, the gem that only an immortal can hold in his hands and it devastates mortals. It starts to get a little traction in Lahore. It couldn't touch the lion, but it's picking off the cubs one by one. Everything that Chamkor was worried about, a challenge to the throne, comes true. One of the other sons, this very sort of mansplainy, manspready man in the bottom of your screen, <laughs> Maharaja Sher Singh, is on the move from his ancestral homes in Batala. And he lays siege to the citadel. And it is a short siege, but it is a terrible siege, which leads to the good people of Lahore hammering on the gates, begging their queen, open the gates, for God's sake, let him in, because we can't take this anymore. The soldiers of Sher Singh have have behaved so badly and so savagely, they can't take it anymore. And so reluctantly, she opens the gates, but only on the condition that he lets her go with honor, pays her a pension, and she will not challenge for the diamond again. And they agree. It is a matter of weeks later that she's sitting in her own palace, her son's palace, Nonihal's old palace, and her maids are brushing her hair, and instead of brushes, they produce bricks and they batter her to death. She dies exactly as her son did, with her head caved in. And they catch the women who do it, and they drag them to the palace. Sher Singh is conveniently on a hunting trip. Conveniently, I say, because um, what happens is the vizier d delivers a terrible punishment to these women. He orders their hands to be cut off, and for their bleeding stumps to be dragged through the street and out of the city limits. Uh, a commentator at the time says he would have done better to rip out their tongues because they are screaming the whole time, Sher Singh told us to do this. We were acting on the king's orders. Because of course Sher Singh knows as long as she was alive, there's a chance of a challenge. Well, he doesn't last too long either. 
So he's sitting on the throne, the Kohenor on his arm, and a few months later, his kinsmen come to his uh, hunting palace, his summer palace, and they come to show him some guns. He likes guns very much. They say, look, we've bought some really cool fowling pistols. You're going to love these. And bang! One goes off accidentally in his chest. <laughs> they are very, very hard-pressed to explain how one bang also went off accidentally in his face and how uh, elsewhere in the grounds of the palace his son is found hacked to death, the crown prince by sabres. And so it goes on and on and on. And in the four years after the death of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, uh, the kingdom has lost three Maharajas, one dowager queen, one crown prince, any number of aristocrats. It is a wash with blood. Until the last man standing is no man at all but this little boy here. A five-year-old boy, Dilip Singh, the youngest son of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, the boy who was never meant to be king. You see, his mother, Rani Jindan, has disappeared. Ah, where's she gone? Oh, she's gone. She's so beautiful. Is Sarah backwards? Okay. Well, she's, <laughs> so she's out. <laughs> she's gone out. Very, very beautiful woman she was. Uh, if you believe the reports, she uh, moved with the sensuality of water. She had almond-shaped eyes, a clear complexion, was beautiful, unnervingly beautiful. But she was also low-born. She was the daughter of the kennel keeper. <laughs> you know, I'm flattered, but... <laughs> This is not the sensuality of water, let me tell you, people. <laughs> uh, can he do that? Maybe go away, put it back on, for God's sake. <laughs> Hilarious comedy timing, whoever that was. Uh, <laughs> So Rani Jindan is a joke in the palace. She is the youngest wife of Ranjit Singh. When she gives birth to this little boy, they start gossiping that he can't possibly be the real father. She must be some kind of slut. She must have slept with somebody else. How could he possibly have fathered such a beautiful child? So when everybody else is dead, and only Dilip Singh, that little boy that you saw uh, uh, in the picture before the darkness, um, is, is the only one left... Instead of actually lamenting this, the people of Lahore, and particularly the aristocrats, are delighted because they have at last some, some chance of stability. They also have a potential puppet, a little boy. They can mould into whatever they want him to be. They can make him do whatever they want him, uh, of him. You know, okay, he can wear the diamond, fine. Sit on the chair, that's fine, but he won't be in charge. Except one woman has different ideas. Rani Jindan. She does this extraordinary thing. She is actually one of my favorite characters in all human history. Um, I, if you came to the feminist thing, you know I know I love a kick-ass woman. This is a proper kick-ass woman. So she comes out of the Zanana, she takes off the veil, and she says, nobody is going to use my kid as a, a puppet. I will sit on the throne with him in my lap. I will rule in his name. Now, you know, this doesn't go down so well with the men of the court. <laughs> It's a really macho court. You know, first of all, you know, to take orders from a woman, that's bad. To take orders from a low-born woman, that's almost intolerable. And so there starts to be a little chafing in Lahore. And listening, nobody likes a good chafe better than the British. <laughs> they love a chafe. You know, they've never been able to set a toe in the north of India while Ranjit Singh is on the throne. Never get close to it. He has an unassailable army. He has might. But now they start hearing reports of this disgruntlement and this woman on the throne and a baby. And so they start making deals with the people who should be closest to the little boy king. And they approach his vizier and the general of his army and they say, look, when the time is right, we want you to betray your king. And sure enough, that is exactly what happens. So I'm going to skip through this. We go in much more detail in the book, but um, forgive me because time is short. Uh, <laughs> Five minutes left, and I've got so much to tell you. Um, so what happens is two manufactured Anglo-Sikh wars take place. The British, who have come into Lahore after a success in the first Anglo-Sikh war, they sign a treaty of friendship with the boy king, saying, you know, look, we're here for you. We're going to stay. Look, you've cost us a lot of money because we've had to fight this war, but we're going to stay for a little bit, and we'll leave when you're 16, and we'll leave as friends. And they buy themselves time so they can prepare for the second Anglo-Sikh war when they smash his army to pieces, but not before they drag his screaming mother and lock her in a tower. So that in the end... What has happened to our slides, William? It's gone a bit mad. 
Has anybody got a notion? I'll just tell you this story. That's all right. I give up with this. So until what happens is that you, all you have, I have a lovely slide, and it's in the book, uh, of a little boy surrounded by grown men having to sign over his kingdom and his co in all. That little boy has no choice in the matter. So what happens to the co in all? Well, it is his misfortune that there is a very um, thrusting young man who is in charge of British interests in India at this time. He is a man called Dalhousie. I give up with this. Um, he's a man called Dalhousie, and he is the new governor general of India, and he wants to make a name for himself. And how better to ingratiate yourself with Queen Victoria than to be the man who presents the Kohenor diamond and lays it at her feet. This Kohenor diamond that represents so much more than itself. It represents India itself, a place that Victoria will never be. But he has to get it out of India first. And this is a problem. Everybody wants the Kohenor back. So what does he do? Well, he acts as a diamond mule himself telling the tiniest circle of trust, his wife and three others, what he's going to do. He goes to Lahore. His wife, who I guarantee has not sewed on a button for 10 years, is asked to create a pouch, which he just big enough to hold a diamond. And by the way, we haven't really told you about this diamond, how big it was. It is written about as if it is the size and heft of a hen's egg. It's craggy. If any of you have been to Scotland, it's like Arthur's seat. It has an irreg irregular kind of shape, and it's kind of hewn roughly in the mogul style. It is a whopper of a rock. But he wears it around his neck, a chain around his neck, another around his waist, so that if anyone tries to take it and slit his throat, they're going to have to hack through his clothes and his torso to get it too. And he rides it hard. Rides it to Bombay, where he's hoping there's a boat waiting to take it away, but there is not a boat there. This idea of bad luck surrounding the Kohenor will reach its absolute peak at this time. He has to wait. He's sweating it out in Bombay going, please, God, I need a ship. But they're all engaged in the Opium War in China. Finally, a ship arrives that is fast. It is not going to attract attention. It's called the Medea. The Kohenor is loaded onto the ship, but none of the crew know what they're carrying. Only the captain, a man called Lockyer, knows, and two people escorting the diamond know what they're carrying. But just days into that voyage, the Medea... For the first man below decks falls, and then another, and then another, and then another. Cholera has broken out on the Medea. And they're falling like dominoes. Lockyer says, don't panic. Stand firm, people, stand firm. We're going to reach there. We're going to make it. We're just off the coast of Mauritius. We're going to get water and medicine. They reach the coastal waters of Mauritius, and Mauritius says, you're not bringing that ship anywhere near here. Go away with your plague ship. We're going to blow you out of the water. And they have to retreat with nothing a modicum of supplies, and a tiny bit of medicine. And Lockyer, somehow the force of this man's character is huge, you can only imagine, because they sail on. He says, we'll get back to Britain, boys. We will get back to Britain, just hold firm. They sail slam into one of the worst typhoons in that part of the world for over 10 years. When this ship finally limps into British territorial waters, and they suddenly realize, with all the press coverage, that Kohenor is here, the Kohenor is here, because the British are obsessed with this idea of the Kohenor and have been for many years. They must have thought this diamond was trying to drag them to hell. The diamond hasn't even made it to the Queen yet. It's just entered British territorial waters, and bad luck starts affecting Queen Victoria personally. Her best friend is a former Prime Minister, Peel. She loves him. He's a great help to Albert. And he's a great horse rider. He goes out riding every day. It has entered this ship and the diamond, territorial waters, and Peel is thrown from his horse, which is weird. But then the horse trips over Peel and falls on Peel and kills Peel, which is really weird. Uh, just a couple of days later, the diamond is getting closer and closer. The East India Company is sort of preparing to do the handover to Queen Victoria. She's visiting her uncle in London. A lunatic comes out of the crowd. Steel tip cane hits her over the head. So when she actually receives this diamond, she does so with a massive black eye and a cut on her head. You can therefore forgive, maybe, the fact that she gets a little bit worried about the diamond. And she starts writing quite a lot and asking people, you know this curse thing with the diamond thing? Can we talk about the curse thing? I know you said there's no curse thing, but I'd like to talk about the curse thing. And so, you know, it takes her a long time before she will sort of get over it. She drives Dalhousie mad to the point where Dalhousie said, if she doesn't want it, she can bloody give it to me. I'll wear it, you know. <laughs> Gratitude. I want to tell you one other thing very quickly, but I can't, I mean, we've no pictures, so just bear with me. I'm going to gallop you through it, and then I know. Ten minutes for the end of this shebang, 
I'm going to take one minute to tell you another, just such a great story. And you just have to live, you're going to have to go with me, hold my hand on this and just imagine this. The diamond is a rock star in Britain. Even though she's worried about it, it is a rock star. And it gets its first outing in the greatest show on earth. In 1851, the British have the great exhibition. A massive museum of glass is created in Hyde Park. The star attraction is the Koh-i-Noor. And it is to be shown to the British public for the very first time. It's displayed in a golden cage as if it was some kind of wild animal that might rip off your face. It is a third of the British population. Six million people will go through that door and file past the Koh-i-Noor, all beating a path to the Koh-i-Noor first. And you know what they do? They come, they see the diamond, and there is a resounding, meh. Because <laughs> it's not shiny and sparkly like the diamonds that they're used to, the diamonds that are coming from Antwerp and from Europe. It isn't like that. It's the Mogul style. It's like, it's the way the Moguls liked it. So Albert, whose idea this whole Great Tech exhibition is, he's beside himself. He's like, got to make this work. This is really bad. This is, meant, this is our like, star turn. This is the Brad Pitt of our show. What are we, what's happening? So he puts little gas lamps around the exhibit. And it doesn't help because this is a building made of glass. So then he puts mirrors and glass lamps around. And that doesn't help either because, you know, Albert, it's glass. So, okay, so he builds this shed around the exhibit. And that does help a little bit, you know, it does help. However, he's also created the very first sauna in Great Britain. <laughs> and people who come to see the Koh-i-Noor are passing out in their droves. <laughs> so when it's taken away from the Great Exhibition back to the tower, like a badly behaving child, it leaves in disgrace, which is when Albert decides to cut it. Even though all his experts say, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. There's a flaw in this diamond. You know William was talking about flaws in the diamond. There's a whopping great flaw in this diamond. His experts say, don't do it. It could go up in smoke like a piece of coal. But he says, no, I'm not, this will not do. And despite their advice, it is cut by men who come from Amsterdam and they halve its size. So the diamond you see in the crown, the diamond that you saw at the beginning of this talk, is half the stone it was, and I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Good job with the slide. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think we have time for one more one question. Should we? Sure, we can take a couple of questions. <laughs> We're still trying to find out. We keep doing these talks, hoping that someone will say. See this? Because <laughs> it has happened, hasn't it? You know people who've got shards of other famous diamonds, don't you? Yes, bizarrely, my sister-in-law has got a bit of the, uh, <laughs> not of the Koh-i-Noor, but the, what's it called? The, um, the big one in the... Oh, uh, it's the uh, Prize for any diamond knowledge, I think. What's the largest diamond in the world? In the, in the Tower of London? <laughs> no, not Hope. <laughs> not the all of. Cullinan, winner goes. Stand up, the winner. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so the Cullinan was this enormous one that was split in three. And even the biggest of the three is the size of a kind of rugby football. Uh, and, and what happens when you go to the Tower of London today is that because of all the desis, all the Indians queuing up, shouting, chore, chore, and, and uh, we want it back, <laughs> that the Brits had to build a kind of conveyor belt. Uh, uh, beside it. And so you see all these moonwalking Indians walking backwards. <laughs> but what usually happens is they get the wrong one because the, the Koh-i-Noor is actually quite small. <laughs> so they sit there shouting at the Cullinan. We got it back! We got it back. So, so the truth is we don't know. I mean, it could have just gone up or just ground into powder. It's, made of, it's, it's made of carbon. Right? It's carbon after all. But you know the thing that I didn't tell you? There's so many really lovely stories in this. I mean, I'm not just saying this because I wrote it. Um, <laughs> we wrote it. And we are very proud of it. But it's just packed full of stories. So the thing, I'll just tell you very briefly. Do you know the person who cut, did the first cut to the diamond uh, was the Duke of Wellington himself. Because Wellington's reputation had been made by India. He would not have even have been in a position to fight Napoleon had he not earned his spurs in India. And so they do this whole thing where this 83-year-old man who insists he wants to do the first cut, and everyone's like going... Mm -hmm. <laughs> God... <laughs> So they <laughs> encase the diamond in lead, 
with only one face remaining so he can just grind it down and do his ceremonial thing. And he does it. And, you know, the crowds are outside, yay, Wellington, and he ignores them all, as he usually does. <laughs> um, and he doesn't live to see the last face cut. Just, uh, I think, three days before the diamond is finished, Wellington too dies. And so this idea of the curse, the curse, the curse, it goes on and on and on. We can take one more? Just yeah. here. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, given this uh, checkered history of the diamond, if you were to be deciding who should it belong to, who would you give it to? <laughs> Over to you, Anita. <laughs> I was just going to say, you know, with the bad luck thing, whoever's really cheesed me off that day. Um, it's, a re it's a really tricky thing, and we, we have taken a very um, uh, conscious decision not to proclaim on, on who this diamond should go to, because there has been, until now, just so much heat in this and very little light. You know, everybody, it's, it, that's for diplomats and lawyers to sort out, you know. And in a way, what we did was we did the casework. We decided that what we wanted to do was tell you the truth about this diamond and where it came from. You know what? It's all yours. Go fight over it. It's fine. Um, I don't know. There is this one school of thought that says, you know, leave it where it is, but put crime tape around the <laughs> exhibit. The, the uh, kind of all sorts of ideas have been mooted. One, yeah. one idea is you can put it at Wagga border. So we've got the Pakistanis coming in one side and the Indians at the other, goose-stepping around, doing all that stuff, uh, and, uh, and shouting at each other through the thing. But it's still <laughs> such a live issue. I mean, we took the book to India and Pakistan first, and there is, it is true to say, a diamond-shaped hole in the psyche of both those countries. Because, again, you know, as it was then in Victoria's time, it is now, the Kohenor represents so much more than itself. It is colonial loot. It is, it is, it is everything it that was done the, in the uh, colonial one, times. Yeah. So a one inch long symbol of, of everything that has been taken. And so if you, if you ask people in this audience uh, what, uh, uh, what should be done with the Jewish art treasures taken by the Nazis, I imagine every hand would raise, give it back to the, yeah. to the owners. But if you ask people around the, what, should be, what should be done with, with colonial loot, you'll get a whole variety. You know, the Brits go, mm, it's, it's a very <laughs> long time ago. Where yeah. does it stop kind and, of and, argument? And, you know? You know, and the, the defense they would put up would be, uh, you know, should we give back, uh, should we ask from Norway the things the Vikings took from Iona? Should we get uh, Sri Lanka to, uh, to uh, should we give back to Sri Lanka the things the Cholas took from? Do you, do you unravel the whole of human history? Do you start suing the Italians for what the Romans did? Or do you say this is you know, the rough and tumble of history and ignore it? But neither solution is, is, is a, 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 an obvious or, or just one. Uh, and so it's a very tricky one. So we leave the question hanging. What is the correct thing to do with, uh, with colonial loot? Sure. Alberto. Well, it's just an idea. If it's really cursed, the queen can let it to Trump for a week or so. <laughs> <laughs> Do you not think he has enough problems at the moment? Uh, well, but but you, do, you do raise a really interesting point. You know what? The last <laughs> reigning monarch to wear it was Queen Victoria. After Victoria, no reigning monarch has worn it. It's only the consort who wears it. Oh. I think the idea being that wives are completely expendable. Uh, <laughs> but it's always the queen who wears it. So the last person to wear it was the queen mother. The last time you would have seen it in public was on the queen mother's coffin. And the next time you might see it, William, is... Uh, well, with Queen Camilla, if that doesn't finish off the British monarchy. <laughs> <laughs>